Well, this evening, uh, we're going to look at the second element of the gospel. And what I mean by that is, in 1 Corinthians 15, turn there with me if you haven't uh, marked this yet, it's kind of like what I would call the overlooked part of the gospel. The gospel is explained by the Apostle Paul and distilled down to two little verses. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And that's the part that we talk about immensely. But look at verse 4. And that he was buried. We kind of usually right by that, and continue, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scripture. And we often spend a lot of time about thinking about that. But 1 Corinthians 15 says that the gospel really has three parts, the death, the burial, the resurrection. In fact, everything about baptism has to do with the burial. It's kind of a commemoration of the burial, of the uh, going down into the waters of death and coming up in newness of life, and it portrays that wonderful precious element. This is a picture of a burial. This is actually uh, uh, one of the many, and you're going to see tonight, many tombs. This is an actual tomb in Jerusalem. Uh, You see the the niche that the body was put on, and I'm going to show you a little later the the garden tomb that most of us uh, who who go to the Holy Land really see as the, the spot that most looks like Christ. But this is what Jesus would have been buried like, only wrapped up. Uh, with uh, tightly with the the aromatic uh, aloes and and uh, myrrh that was placed in between between his body and then they'd wrap a layer and more like that and they actually as I told you a couple of weeks ago they actually wrapped uh, like the foot all the way up the leg they wrapped the hand all the way up to the shoulder uh, they even sometimes wrapped the fingers individually and then they kept wrapping them over that that's why as I shared last time when The apostles ran to the tomb and looked in and saw the grave clothes lying undisturbed with the body gone. It says, on the spot, they believed. Because they knew how tightly, they knew it was physically impossible to sprinkle 100 pounds of spices over a body and tightly bind it and to have someone get out of that thing and have it stay in the shape of fingers, hands, arms, legs, head, etc., And actually what happens when you do that with all the spices, there's a a very great stickiness to this when it when they're laid out and so probably the whole thing uh, was was somewhat collapsed but it was still in quite a body shape and they just could see that it was empty on the inside. So this is a a little beginning of our look uh, of the burial accounts. Last time we looked in the four Gospels, we saw there are 26 verses. We read through these verses. If you want to ever study in depth the burial of Christ, I would encourage you just to read the burial verses. And after we get done tonight, uh, it'll probably spur you to look at more of the details because there's so much here for us to to learn about. Christ's burial was physical, and if you want to look in 1 John, I'm going to remind you of what we learned in the scripture, chapter 4 of 1 John. Christ's burial was physical. We have to always remember, turn back to the the end of your Bibles, to 1 John 4, uh, Christ's burial had to be physical. Why? Because the resurrection was going to be contested. So God wanted to have a physical Burial of Jesus Christ. So Christ's burial was physical. First John four two. Uh, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Verse three. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And that's part of the Antichrist plan. Uh, in in First John chapter four and chapter five, there are all these verses about the physical nature of Christ. That he had a physical body. He had a physical body when he was crucified and was the Christ as a crucified Christ. He had a physical body. A physical body, the body of the Christ, the Son of God, was buried and that same physical body rose. Look at chapter 5 of 1 John, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten. By this we know the love of God if we keep his commandments. 
Verse 5, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Christ's burial was a real physical burial. The body of Jesus was placed in a real physical tomb. His resurrection had to be a physical resurrection. His physical body came out of the tomb. Why all that emphasis? Because the first great heresy, the first great error to attack the church was Gnosticism that said that the Christ spirit came on Christ at his baptism, empowered this man named Jesus through his earthly ministry, and the Christ spirit left him on the cross, and just the man Jesus was buried. And that's the view of liberal theologians who do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of God. So neither demons nor unbelieving men have ever been willing to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ came in flesh, and that Jesus Christ died and his body was buried, and that he, in that body, rose again. So Christ's burial was physical, Uh, Here's just another picture of a tomb. Uh, I'll show you many tombs. They're all very similar. So it really gives us an idea that it was up on a ledge like that, that Christ's wrapped body was, was placed lovingly by two men. And what I want to emphasize this evening is those two men that were involved in the burial of Christ. The first man is the man that we know as the man who came to Jesus by night. His name was Nicodemus. In fact, every time I read the greatest verse in the Bible and the most well-known verse in the Bible, which is John 3.16, every time I read it, every time I hear it, I think that that man who came to Jesus at night and had the gospel according to Jesus presented heard Jesus say that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Can you imagine hearing those words for the first time coming from Jesus Christ as he himself spoke the wonderful word of life to Nicodemus who came to him by night? Well, that's the first character we're going to see tonight is Nicodemus. The second one comes out of nowhere. He's a strange, unknown figure in the scriptures. Joseph of Arimathea. Ramathea, another way of saying uh, the, the town just north of Jerusalem, the town where Samuel was born, the town where Samuel was buried, the town where Joseph of Arimathea was from. It's just seven miles from Jerusalem, and there a wealthy man lived who had become one of the greats of Israel. One of the members of the council that ruled Israel, one of the those who, who were the detractors of Christ, but he was a believer. Well, the next thing we see is Christ's burial was strategic. We went through these verses last time, but I want to remind you of them. God wanted all to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was the human body of Jesus who rose from the grave. God needed Christ's body to be properly buried after his death. His burial had to be witnessed by both disciples and enemies. You couldn't have the deck stacked. You couldn't have just the good guys see him buried because what would happen is then people could claim, well, it wasn't really, he wasn't really buried. He never really died. Jesus strategically in God's plan had to be buried by both friends and enemies. So it would be an unbiased strategic witness that he really died, that his body was dead. And so God orchestrated all that, that historic dawning on resurrection morn when Jesus rose from the dead, his empty tomb would stand forever as the infallible witness to his bodily resurrection. Think how vital Christ's body was. God couldn't allow such a crucial element in his plan as the burial of Christ's body to be in the hands of Roman soldiers. Think about it. God who, who oversees everything. In fact, Jesus says not one sparrow hops on the ground. When it says falls, the word is literally hopping. It's not just every time a sparrow dies and hits the dust. It's literally, Jesus said, your father knows every time every sparrow hops on the ground. A God of such minute detail, do you think he would overlook one of the most strategic elements of the cross, and that is the body of Christ. Do you know what Roman soldiers did with the bodies of executed criminals? It's a gruesome thing. 
They might have thrown it and defiled his body further by tossing it down in the garbage dump uh, with the bodies of other executed criminals. And then nobody would have known whether he, where he was and they wouldn't have known how to know that he had risen if he'd have just been thrown into the dump and the trash with everyone else. They did worse things than that. They abused, they desecrated those bodies. And so God was watching over this whole process. Most likely the Jewish authorities would probably have done worse than the Romans. If you think about it, they didn't like Jesus at all. And they feared that he might be claimed to rise from the dead. So they might have dismembered the body and done all kinds of things to make sure that people would never think that Jesus rose. So those authorities, the Jewish, would not have allowed Christ's body to fall into the care of his disciples. They thought the disciples would seek to hide it and then claim he was resurrected. Look at verse 62 of Matthew 27 with me because I want you to see the strategic nature of how God is working behind the scenes. And, and, and as we go through this, you see how beautifully God orchestrated the details of Christ's burial. It says in verse 62, on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. And they said, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. These leaders just verified he was in the tomb. Dead. Wasn't that convenient? The highest court of the land. The the court of the 70. The most revered men of, of Judaism said that body, that, that deceiver, that, that body that was executed on the Roman cross is in that tomb and we want to make sure it stays in that tomb. They just verified that he really died and that he really was buried. So continue reading. Therefore, verse 64, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead. And that last deception will be worse than the first Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. The construction of those words imply that Pilate was saying, you have something bigger here than you even realize. I don't think you're going to be able to secure that tomb. Remember, Pilate was frightened by Christ. He's the only one that got to have a face-to-face interview. The only interview Jesus granted among his detractors. And it was a witnessing opportunity. Christ was testifying to Pilate. And Pilate was fearful when he realized who Jesus was. And I think he's saying, I don't think all the guards in the world can make this thing secure. Verse 66, so they went and made the tomb secure and they sealed the stone and set the guard Uh, Just another picture of, this is the garden tomb itself. This is probably one of the favorite sites of almost all uh, evangelical Christians around the world. You look past the the beautiful flowers to this uh, hewn out of the rock tomb. This part's been added because it's it's had multiple uses. Remember, Christ only needed it for a weekend. And so it's been a lot of things since then. And uh, this is the door. This is the track that the stone was in. Uh, The stone has never been found that went to this tomb. It's very possible that when that mighty angel came and rolled the stone away that you know it might have been such a large event that it just broke the stone we don't know but uh, I'll be showing you after a while inside this tomb but uh, this this event of Christ was was very strategic the next slide tells us that Christ's burial was also verifiable. The solution was that God had to have the body buried by one or more of the authorities themselves who were also disciples. For this purpose, God chose two of the members of the governing Jewish body, the Sanhedrin, Joseph and Nicodemus. Why? Because the Bible says you can't take one witness. You have to take something at the hands of two or three witnesses. So God received the witness from two believing members of the Sanhedrin, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Thus, they would have access to the necessary information about the time and circumstances of Christ's death. They would also have access to the Roman governor in order to make the required arrangements to acquire the body before the soldiers would do something to it and dispose of it. They would have enough wealth of their own to be able to make the needed preparations for a suitable resting place 
so that the body could be placed somewhere, so that the disciples could see and know that that body was placed somewhere, so that at the propitious time, God could bring them to the tomb and they could see that it was empty. What's amazing is the early church never worshipped in the next slide. There we go. They never worshipped the place of the tomb. This is right outside the garden tomb. I mean, within the garden, right outside the place I showed you a moment ago. This is a a wine press. This is a large spot within that garden that was used and they would put the wine uh, or the grapes down here in in, uh, this part right here and then they would trample them and it would flow down into this area and settle and they would scoop it up. So it was a literal working garden. Uh, Has In fact, uh, when you go on a tour of this place, which is actually abutting Golgotha, the, the side of Golgotha or Golgotha where Christ was crucified connected to it is this garden and it was a large working garden because it has one of the largest cisterns in all Jerusalem that is an ancient cistern that goes back to a first century before as a part of the premises so it was a very wealthy commercial garden and so this Burial was verifiable. Next slide tells us that Christ's burial was also anticipated. If you want to look at John 7, starting in verse 50, I want to read to you something. Because as Nicodemus and Joseph searched the Old Testament, they would find the Messianic prophecies and discover that many of them had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. How do we know they studied? Look at John 7, verse 50. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? And look what the Sanhedrin, the ruling body, commissioned Nicodemus and also Joseph to do. Verse 52. They answered and said, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look. That was a challenge to a teacher in Israel. They said, why don't you spend a little time and check the Bible and see if it's even possible that this deceiver could be the Christ. So Nicodemus did. He, he began searching and looking to see if any prophet could arise out of Galilee. And certainly he began to put together the pieces. Jesus who declared himself to be the Lamb of God. And he would conclude that, that he was actually offered on Passover. See, we don't even think in terms like that, but but Nicodemus would have remembered Christ's initial statement that he was the lamb, the Passover lamb, and then all of a sudden he would have said, whoa, wait a minute, he was actually crucified at Passover. He actually came into the city of Jerusalem on the day that the lambs were chosen. He actually stayed around Jerusalem for the four days that the lambs were supposed to stay around Jerusalem before they were slain. And all these would have started to come together in his mind as he thought through what Christ had said. Then Nicodemus would have realized that he would be lifted up. Do you remember what Jesus said in John three fourteen? He said the Son of Man must be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness. And Nicodemus began putting all these pieces together in his mind. And this meant crucifixion and the Passover lambs were slain at 3 p.m. The two men would know almost exactly the time when God's lamb would die on the cross. Surely Nicodemus and Joseph would have read Isaiah 53 and have noticed verse 9. And Isaiah 53, 9 says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. And somehow, from John 7.52 onward, Nicodemus and Joseph were doing this study. And somehow, in that study, they began to anticipate that Jesus was going to be lifted up and slain. And they began to prepare literally months before by building this tomb. Because it said it was a brand new tomb Joseph had made in anticipation of Christ's burial. We'll see that as we continue. Somehow these two men had become friends probably after this encounter in John seven fifty two. They had resolved to make preparations for Jesus' burial. It may seem that they had other interviews with Jesus. Throughout the scriptures, uh, we hear of Jesus having different times after his messages talking to people and they're not identified. Surely in one of these many times, these men had begun to question even more and ask him, 
Though the scriptures don't tell us that, perhaps they had learned from his own lips about his approaching crucifixion. He had indeed told Nicodemus he would be lifted up as Moses had lifted up the serpent in order that men might have everlasting life. It hardly seems likely that Nicodemus, Israel's greatest teacher, would not try to learn much more about these things and where better to learn them than going right to Jesus and beginning to question him as Nicodemus had believed in him. Well, if nothing else, Nicodemus would surely have gone back to an intensive study of the Messianic scriptures and these earnest studies he probably shared with his friend. Well, Next slide is uh, an inside view of the garden tomb. This is what they've added. Uh, This wrought iron is here, but right there is the shelf uh, where Christ would have been laid, and uh, there's an unfinished part of the tomb. This tomb, even to this day, as archaeologists have looked at it, they say it was hastily made. Uh, it was not, the stone was not finished on the inside like most tombs. Those first ones, you remember the ones I showed you with the guy laying in there? That was completely uh, chiseled out and it, and it had an impact hammer that made the rock to be a smooth and not rough. This tomb is rough. It looks like someone hastily had it gouged and that they didn't fully prepare it. In fact, it to this day is unfinished, this tomb that's known as the garden tomb. Next slide tells us that Christ's burial was costly. In Mark 15, 43, we find that, that uh, there are some specific elements, and if you want to turn there with me, that, that remind us of the, the cost, and I'm going to go through these with you. In 1543, Joseph of Arimathea, being a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate, and ask for the body of Jesus. Sometimes we've never really thought about the cost of burying Jesus. I'm not talking about in dollars and cents. I'm talking about the cost it was to the career of those two men. They were never heard of again in the pages of scripture, nor in secular history do we find them being around in the early church. It's very possible this cost them everything. What specifically did it it cost them? Next slide, they gave their time to Jesus. It cost them a lot of time. First of all, they learned about Jesus. They had to have spent time studying together during the many months following Nicodemus' first meeting with Jesus. The two friends spent much time, I'm sure, in the 53rd chapter. There was especially seen by them the sacrificial and saving work of Christ. And those were the theme of the words that that Jesus had given Nicodemus about being lifted up and drawing men to him and being the Lamb of God and him taking upon him the sin of the world. And and so they had invested a lot of time. They invested their time, next slide, uh, getting a tomb like this ready. This is another view of that garden tomb. Uh, You can see a little more clearly the the place where the the stone went right along here. This is actually a little ledge, uh, a little uh, runway that the stone, and you can see uh, where the prop stone would have been left on this side. You can also see the chisel marks as this thing, uh, it's almost like this has been uh, cut away as they made the sheer rock face. Uh, this part was added at a later time. In fact, you can see these little bumps here in the wall. At one time, this was used as some kind of a home. I mean, this is 2,000 years old. And as far as we know, the early church never revered the empty tomb. What they said was, he is risen. And what it's all about is to go and tell people not to come back and make a shrine of it. And so even if this isn't Christ's tomb, it doesn't matter because there's nothing unique about this tomb anymore because it was only used for a short time. And it was only to be a strategic, verifiable witness to the disciples that he was risen. Next slide. They gave their treasures to Jesus. These men gave the first treasure, and that was the the obedience that they offered him. Uh, These who invested time in that study began to look at what it said in Isaiah 53, that with the rich man, uh, he made his death. And so, so all of a sudden, Nicodemus began preparing, and we know that he prepared a literal fortune. He prepared a hundred pounds of the costliest goods of the ancient world to bury Christ. And then Joseph began the process of this tomb. And I just, I want you to think through it with me. 
Because Joseph made it his duty to stay in touch with the events, he knew exactly when Christ died. He was watching over the whole process. Being a Sanhedrin member, he had been right there. He was watching because as soon as Christ had given up the spirit and the soldier had pierced through his side, Joseph was already on his way to the headquarters of Pilate. Joseph made it there immediately. In fact, he preceded the official death notice of the centurion, if you read closely. He had invested a lot. These men paid a high price for their actions. Uh, Never so far as biblical record goes were they ever heard of again, but there can be no doubt that this one act cost them their positions. It probably cost them their possessions too, and possibly even their lives. But these men who publicly followed Jesus, while the women watched from a distance, no doubt in amazement, these two respected members of the Sanhedrin went to the cross, gently lowering the body of Jesus down from that cross and with their own hands carrying between them the earthly body of the Lord of glory. What an amazing thing that these who had followed Jesus in secret, who had come at night, who never openly confessed him, became the only ones to publicly identify with Christ at his death. Isn't that amazing? The ones who, during Christ's life, boldly stood next to him and boldly preached for him, fled. And those who, in Christ's life, secretly followed him and never publicly confessed him, became emboldened at his death and gently lowered him. These respected members of the Sanhedrin, wound in linen clothes, applied the spices and the ointments, and laid the body of Jesus into that tomb. And then they departed. It cost Joseph and Nicodemus. They truly invested their time and their treasures. They decided to assume the obligation of Christ's burial. Joseph proceeded to purchase the land, cut out the tomb, plant the garden, as Nicodemus purchased the required materials for the burial and hid them somewhere. Most likely, what most scholars think is that that Joseph got this tomb going and, and got it all ready and hewn out, and Nicodemus went off and bought his fortune of stuff and stored it probably in the tomb because because of the timing of the crucifixion, Jesus was having to be prepared and in the ground or in the, the tomb before sunset. And that's what makes this so amazing. Let me just remind you of a few things. There are many mysteries that only the hand of God could ever explain in this. Why, for example, would a rich man of Arimathea, seven miles from Jerusalem, buy a burial ground in Jerusalem instead of his hometown? It was the custom of the ancient world to be buried either where you were born or where you lived the majority of your life. The garden tomb was neither. So it's a mystery. Why would this rich guy who could pick anywhere he wanted to be buried in Arimathea, Rama, north, why would he pick Jerusalem? Well, maybe it wasn't for him is the answer. Secondly, and especially hard to explain, is the location of this tomb. Why would a super wealthy man who had his pick of the whole city of Jerusalem, and by the way, from ancient times, people have always wanted to be buried on the Mount of Olives, Why would this man buy a tomb near a place of execution? Why would he cut an expensive, hand-cut rock tomb near a spot that would often ring with the death cries and screams of those being slowly tormented to death on crosses? That would not be a normal choice for a tomb. Remember, tombs back then were for you to lay your family and for the family to come to. And the family would often come because they would wait for the the body to decompose and the family would come and collect the bones and put them in ossuaries. And then the next member of the family would come. It was a frequent place that people went to. Why would they pick and why would a rich man pick a place where there would often be adjacency to a hill called Golgotha, a place where day after day there would come the cries of dying criminals and the wails of their mourning families? Would you ever pick a place like that for a burial if you were loaded and could pick any place you wanted? No. People love these quiet cemeteries that, you know, look like gardens today. I mean, people haven't changed. It's very strange. 
that Joseph picked a place that wasn't in his hometown, nor where he lived, and a place that was adjacent to an execution spot that as often as for seven or for as long as seven days there would be the horrific screams of crucified people wailing through the day and night. Finally, it was a brand new tomb, not one in which others of the family had been buried. That, that's what it says. If you want to turn to John 19 with me, look at verse 41. It says, now there was in a place where he was crucified a garden, John 19, 41. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. That's very significant. You see, if it had been an old tomb, if it had been a used one, If it had been one of somebody that had been pillaged and plundered of some ancient time, it would have been unclean to everybody that observed the law of God because they were very careful about burial. They were very careful about things being contaminated and defiled by death. And so the only way that you could have a fitting tomb for the Lord of glory is if you got one especially made fresh. And Joseph did that. It was a new tomb. Not one in which others had been buried. One that Joseph himself had hewn out of the rock. And that's what Matthew adds in 2760. Perhaps not wishing even others to know about his preparation. But as the Jewish laws went, this beautiful tomb Jesus used could never be used by Joseph or his family. Because Jewish law said that no observant Jew could be buried in the tomb of anyone except his direct family. You couldn't cross and defile it with others being buried. The Jews are very particular. Even to this day, every time there's any death in the, in the Jewish community, there is a very rapid, very careful, very proper burial. They're very fastidious about burial. And Joseph knew the rules. And so Joseph gave up that tomb and that garden permanently to the Lord. Did you know when Jesus walked out of the tomb on resurrection morn, Joseph walked out of the business of owning that little plot of ground for a tomb. It was done for him. He could never. When he gave that to Jesus, he could never get it back. Think about what it cost him. It cost him his reputation. It cost him his position, I'm sure, on the Sanhedrin. It cost him the immense wealth it took to make that garden tomb because these men gave their treasures to Jesus. Well, let me go through. We just have a couple minutes. There's a, a, the, one of the stones. Go back. Let them see it for a second. That's an example. This is, uh, there are many of these burial stones around Jerusalem. Uh, that one is, is a smaller one. It's only about two and a half or three feet wide. But there are many. But let me give you a series of things to think about before we go. The incredible details of Christ's burial. The first one, the next slide, is that, and look at verse 34, a side pierced. That's the first element of Christ's Burial. Why was Christ's side pierced before he could buried, be buried? Because the Romans would not permit a crucified man to be taken down before he was dead. And Jesus had to be placed in the tomb before sunset. Because he had to be there three days and three nights. And he had to be there before sundown to count as the whole first day. Remember the Jewish way of reckoning is any part equals the whole. So there was a rush to get him there, and the Jewish leaders requested Pilate that the legs of the three men would be broken to ensure quick death. Do you remember that? You see, what was going on here was Satan prompting the religious leaders to demand that Jesus have the crushing. I wonder if they had all started a Bible study. I wonder if they had all figured out the psalm that said not one of his bones would be broken. So there was a race on here. Satan seeking to cause the word of God to not be fulfilled and God watching over his word to perform it. And so this race was coming. The leader saying, break the bones. And God saying not one bone would be broken. But the Romans had a custom of breaking the bones. Usually... In the case of a crucifixion, a large wooden mallet was used to shatter the legs of a victim, making it impossible for him to raise himself in order to breathe. Although the added pain would be excruciating, it was short-lived because the death 
would result quickly from suffocation. According to the eminent Bible scholar Alfred Edersheim, the soldiers would then administer what was called the death stroke. It consisted of the jabbing of a spear into the the heart of the individual. The reason for adding the death stroke to the crushing of the leg seems to have been to remove all doubt that death had occurred. Now listen to this. It is remarkable that the Roman soldiers did not do what they were commanded to do. Break the victim's legs. But they did do what they were not supposed to do. Pierce the Savior's side. They were not commanded to pierce. They were commanded to crush the legs. They didn't crush the legs. They administered rather the jab to the heart. It's wonderful Because in both matters they fulfilled the very word of God. The bones of the Passover lamb were not to be broken, Exodus 12, Numbers 9, and Psalm 34, 20. So the Lord's bones were protected by the Lord. His side was to be pierced, however, as Zechariah 12 says in Revelation 1. So that was done by one of the soldiers. In 1 John 5, John deals with the evidence that Jesus has come in the flesh and he presents three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. The Spirit relates to Pentecost, the water to his baptism, and the blood to his crucifixion. In each of these events, God made it clear Jesus is what he claimed to be. In fact, in John 19.35, the apostle makes it clear that the water and blood should encourage his readers to believe that Jesus is the Christ. As it says in verse 35, And he who has seen and testified, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. What's he talking about? Verse 34. The soldiers pierced his side and immediately came out blood and water. So his side was pierced. You know the the picture of it, the soldier there, the lower crosses. And Jesus' side was pierced. One last thing I want to show you about, and that's in verse 38 at the beginning. A witness was chosen. Who was Joseph of Arimathea? Well, when you assemble all the available information about Joseph, you learn he was rich. That's what Matthew 27 tells us. He was a prominent member of the council. That's Matthew, or Mark 15. He was a good and righteous man. He never consented to what they did. And that's what Luke tells us in chapter 23. He was a member of the believing minority of Jews who were praying for the Messiah to come. That's what Uh, It tells us in Mark 15 and Luke 2 when you compare these two. And he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what verse 38 tells us. And it says in verse 38, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, John 19, 38, being a disciple of Jesus but secretly for fear of the Jews. Jesus had a witness chosen. John informs us Joseph was a secret disciple for fear of the Jews. The Greek word secret is a perfect passive. It could be translated having been secreted. Now you say, what does that mean? Well, it's an interesting thought. If you take this uh, in, in the, the form it was written, it would be the same word for having been kept secret. In other words, Joseph was God's secret agent in the Sanhedrin. Now, I know he didn't go and sign up to be that. But see, that's what providence is all about. Providence is when God uses the natural course of life and superintending weaves it together to accomplish his wonderful purpose. And when you look back, you go, I didn't know God was doing that. But after it happens, you say, that was God's providential purpose. Fitting that all together. When Joseph joined the council, he was not yet a believing man. But when he came to faith in Christ, he was the man that God had providentially led to be secreted, to be hidden away, to secretly be an agent for God on the Sanhedrin, to know exactly when Jesus was going to be crucified, to know exactly their plans and preparations so he could get this tomb ready, so he could get it hewn out, so it would be a new tomb, the tomb of a rich man, and the tomb that was adjacent. So very quickly, Christ's body could be taken down and put into it before the religious leaders could interfere. From the divine standpoint, Joseph was being protected so he could be available to bury the body of Jesus. There are many mysteries about this, but he was the witness that God used. Well, just before we go, next slide. Another view of another tomb. Uh, This is more like the one probably Lazarus was in because it was down and uh, Lazarus was uh, down in a tomb like this. But there are many. You can see in the background the rolling stone here. It's right there. See it? 
and that stone would go in front of this doorway. Uh, and, and that stone, of course, is still intact. This is, by the way, the Herodian family tombs. This is where Herod's uh, uh, children and, and wives were buried. It's still present in Jerusalem. L- let me just show you a couple more things. The next slide we're going to see next time. There was a price to be paid, uh, and we'll look at that. Part of it was this public, uh, back on that slide, look at for just a second, the public... Uh, there it is, where Joseph, I mean, they had to actually lay out the body and wash it. I mean, there were all these rules that, that could not have been hidden. I mean, they went to this tomb where all the stuff was, but they had to do it out in the open, and so these guys were paying a price. The next slide we'll see next time. The scripture was fulfilled, every part of it. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is another view of a burial place. Uh, then the symbol is completed. We're going to look into why myrrh had to be used, aloe and myrrh. Fascinating. Uh, next slide. A little bit about myrrh, we'll study. That's what it looks like and how it's made. His body had to be buried. We'll see that in verse 40. And uh, it went into a tomb like this that was prepared. One last thing that I want to tell you before we go, and that is where we're going to pick up next time. There's some lessons as I read through all this material and prayed over it that I just want to share with you. The first lesson is do what you can do. That's the lesson of Joseph and Nicodemus. They couldn't be his disciples in public. They were kept by God in the background. They couldn't preach. We never hear them testifying publicly and preaching. They couldn't go on the missionary journeys that the Lord sent them on, so they did what they could do. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't go off like Chris and Rebecca Terry in the Master Seminary. I can't do anything. Well, do what you can do. That's the lesson of Joseph and Nicodemus. Do what you can do. They didn't preach. They didn't go on missionary journeys. They didn't follow Jesus around. They prepared for his burial. Secondly, give what you can't keep. They gave their time. We can't keep our time. Our time is fleeing away. They gave their futures. They gave their security. They gave their treasures, all of which are temporary, whether we acknowledge them or not. And whatever you give to Jesus lasts forever. And they knew that. Gain what you cannot lose. Anything given to Christ will last and forever will remember the borrowed tomb, and the faithfulness of these two men who risk everything for someone they love so dearly. I hope that the burial of Christ touches your heart as it does mine. Father in heaven, I thank you for the exquisite details you have placed in your word that Christ, our Savior and Lord, was crucified for our sins according to scripture and that he was buried. He was buried in a way that it would be verifiable, that it would be physical, that it would be a beautiful fulfillment of your word. And you wondrously moved on the hearts of two men. And those men decided that they would do what they could do, and they would give what they could not keep, and they would gain what they would never lose. And today we have that same choice. And I pray as we look into the week ahead that we would do what we can do for you, that we would speak for you, we would testify for you, we would commune with you, we would love you and worship you and pray to you and search you out in your word, and that we would give to you what we can't keep. Our time is fleeting by, our strength is going, our treasures are really just borrowed. We can't keep them, we certainly can't take them with us unless we give them to you and then we never lose them. I pray that we would regularly reassess our portfolio of time and treasure and give to you what we'll never lose. And I pray that you would move as we look through these details in the days ahead and see that your burial is such a call to us to sacrifice also, as they did, for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.